Equity Mates. From our mates at Spaceship. Investing made easy. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates. We are back for the week. It is Monday. My name is Bryce, and uh, as always, I'm jo- as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy Ren, uh, and we're back. Ren. We are we are back. Uh, appropriately socially distanced. Socially distanced. <laughs> um, feels weird back to be back in the studio. Um, we obviously took a week off, and obviously thinking of everyone out there who's still locked down because of COVID. Um, hopefully we can get you through the next 15 minutes and I uh, hope everyone gets through the next week and then uh, we're, we're back back and out there again. And shout out to our Osbys who have obviously been busy over the week off with a new, <laughs> with a new background. I don't know if we can see the, the bear over here representative of Ren's attitude towards the markets and me being the bull. <laughs> <laughs> the irrational optimist always, yes. But uh, yeah, looking good. If you have any uh, feedback or suggestions, if you want your name up in lights, uh, let us know and we'll uh, do our best to get it up there. It's not going to happen, but <laughs> it could happen. It could happen. But look, anyway, today we're going to talk about uh, a couple of news stories that have caught our eye recently. There's a lot going on in markets. Um, but we want to take a step back and just talk about some longer term stories that uh, either excite us or may have some relevance for uh, retail investors out there. Uh, the first one isn't so much a news story, but more a love affair. <laughs> and that is um, Stripe, the startup. Well, I don't know if you can call it a startup anymore, but one of probably the greatest business story of the 2010s. Yes. Uh, got a new valuation earlier this year, $95 billion. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Second highest valued startup, a private, private startup. Um, so we'll talk about that, but for people who haven't heard of Stripe before, do you want to give us a bit of a 101? I'll do my best to give a 101, Ren. Well, we use, we use their services, <laughs> yeah, so I don't so, think you can. Um, the way that we use Stripe anyway is it's payments, um, and they run all of our back-end payment systems, really. Um, so you're thinking merch, all the support functionality that we have, uh, it's all run by Stripe, and I must say, it's very easy. It is very, very, easy. very easy. Yeah, very and easy. they've done well to carve out um, real ownership, uh, I guess, of that market. Well, from what I've seen, anyway. But um, as I understand it, and you might be able to shed more light, is that they aren't just in um, the payments that I'm talking about. They're not. Well, they they started there. They now have 14 different products. But let's take a step back for people who aren't familiar, because the founding story and the two founders are pretty incredible. Uh, Patrick and John Collison, uh, two Irish brothers, um, geniuses. Yes. The word genius is thrown around a lot these days, but these guys are legitimately geniuses. Um, Patrick, the older brother, John, the younger brother. I hope I got that around the right way. Um, they went to Y Combinator, the Silicon Valley startup yeah, accelerator, startup. Yeah. Uh, when they were 19 and 17, respectively. Um, started up a business, sold it for $5 million, all before they went to uni. You hate to see it. (laughs) So pretty impressive. One of the brothers, I can't remember which one, won a whole bunch of like Irish national science prizes and a whole bunch of stuff. Like these guys are geniuses. Yeah. One of them goes to Harvard. One of them goes to MIT. The, I can't remember which one. I think the, the brother that went to MIT got in using SAT scores that he took when he was 13 years old. What? Yeah. <laughs> and the then, what, they just last forever. Well, yeah, like the score's the score. That's what yeah. he got, but he got it when he was 13. 13. Yeah. The, uh, one of the brothers, again, I should, I should have written more notes, but one of the, the, um, one of the brothers finished either his last year or his last two years of the Irish school curriculum in 20 days. Just what punched the hell? it out. Yeah. <laughs> so these guys are these geniuses. Guys are nuts. Yeah, sold their first business that they founded as teenagers, took through Y Combinator, sold it for five million dollars, then went to uni. While they were at Harvard and MIT, respectively, they were building apps um, to pay their way through uni, and they realized that every app they were building, payments sucked. Yeah. Online payments sucked. PayPal existed, but to take credit card payments, it was difficult. Um, and so they decided to fund, uh, well, start Stripe uh, to solve that problem. Here's the all-star cast of initial investors in Stripe. Elon Musk, Peter Thiel, 
uh, Max Levchin, who people may not be familiar with, but a co-founder of PayPal and Sequoia Capital. I mean, you couldn't really ask for a better cap table. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Pretty phenomenal. Pretty phenomenal. So from those uh, not so humble beginnings, uh, Stripe uh, has raised a number of rounds as they've taken over the world and solved this problem of online payments. Uh, their Series H funding round was earlier this year. Series H. Series H, H yeah. <laughs> raised, I think, 600 mil um, at a $95 billion valuation. Jeez, um, do, are they are they profitable? I would assume so. Yeah, yeah. surely. Yeah. Wow, it's yeah, pretty phenomenal. The, I guess the big question for us as investors is when are these bad boys going to go public? I know. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of uh, go, well, I think before we talk about when they go public, these guys think incredibly long term, like multi decade time horizons. Uh, they take up to three years to hire someone. That's unbelievable. That, like, imagine if you're waiting How for the you... job offer. <laughs> yeah, but also, like, um, to be able to put up with functioning with a business for so long without a key yeah. role. Yeah. Well, and, their, their and... logic is um, whenever you bring someone in, they eventually start hiring people themselves and, yeah. it, like, it expands exponentially from there. So if you get that first hire wrong, you've, create, you've created a... Yeah. a chain of poor Heavy. hires so three years yeah their wow. first non-technical hire apparently someone had to guarantee that they would pay them back his salary if he didn't deliver because they were like this guy can't code what <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> holy that's crazy yeah so <laughs> this guy can't code. you asked the question uh when are they going to ipo which is a question that so many investors are asking yeah just because of the phenomenal growth this company has had um no no timeline yet um but i i think we need to coin a new term you know for a long time we've talked about unicorns startups uh, that are private still so not publicly listed that are worth over a billion dollars but there are there are so many uni unicorns now it's not no longer mystical it's no longer magical yeah so many bits so many startups have reached that billion dollar valuation i think we need to coin a term for a hundred billion dollar startups because there's one and then there's two nipping at their heels to get to that hundred billion dollar mark okay can you guess them uh spacex uh, SpaceX's last funding put it at seventy-four billion, so it's one of the two that are nipping at that heel. Um, and uh, the TikTok guys, ByteDance. ByteDance, yeah. yeah. So ByteDance, one hundred and forty billion, highest valued privately held startup. Wow. Uh, so we got to come up with a startup. term for that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Stripe ninety-five, SpaceX seventy-four. I think, yeah. I mean, and it's just going to show as well these big companies. Same with um, Uber before it went public um they are now just holding on for longer and longer mm. raising in the private markets yeah. like raising 600 million in private markets in series h there's no need to go public so much capital there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, well we will be keeping a close eye on um on the stripe guys yeah and for, we will come up IPO. we will come up with a term for a hundred billion dollar startups <laughs> or suggest a term yeah true <laughs> true and we'll also start thinking in multi-year decades that's pretty multi -year impressive multi-year decades I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Most decades are multi-year. Multi <laughs> <laughs> True. All right. Well, um, moving on, Ren. Um, and this one was another one that caught our eye. And uh, it is about Lena Khan. Yes. 32-year-old whiz over in the States. Yeah, we're, uh, we're making ourselves feel quite bad <laughs> yeah. by talking about young people achieving but, a lot. Yes, particularly me, as I'm over 30 <laughs> you now. You are over 30. <laughs> so, for people who are unfamiliar, who is Lena Khan? Uh, Lena Khan, at just 32 years old, has just been sworn in as the chair of the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Yes. Over in uh, the states, obviously. In the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, U.S. government appointments may not seem exactly like the news story that we talk about on this show or on Ausbiz, but it's relevant. And the reason that it's relevant, uh, if we take a step back. Antitrust uh, law over in the US, competition law in Australia, is enforced by two key government agencies in the US, the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice. Lena Khan is now heading up the Federal Trade Commission. And if we take a step further back, antitrust laws. Great step back. <laughs> um, it, it's basically the law that, laws that were put in place to break up monopolies 
uh, to control businesses that have too much market power, to stop them, you know, uh, unfairly competing or, you know, put it pricing to put competitors out of business or to harm consumers and the like. Um, which you might see where this is going. Yeah. Uh, the big tech, Democrats and Republicans can't agree on anything these days. They can't even agree on the definition of infrastructure. But the one thing they can agree on <laughs> Does is one side take my definition of infrastructure? No, no there's airport? a question. No, this is completely off topic. But the, the Democrats take a more expansive view and talk about like the social infrastructure. Ah, infrastructure okay, is okay, everything, everything that is needed for a society to function. Okay. Uh, whereas Republicans take a more roads and bridges. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is, a, is concrete being poured? The, yeah, that yeah. version of infrastructure. So... Um, Inter uh, important to note, uh, Lena Khan 20, in 2017, so she would have been 28, uh, wrote a article for the Yale Law Journal that's being passed around legal circles and is relevant for investors uh, in these big tech companies. Um, it was titled Amazon's Antitrust Paradox. And it basically suggested that the current way US regulators look at competition law, look at, you know, these potentially monopolistic businesses is wrong and that there needs to be a new framework put in place. And for about four decades now, the approach has been, if it leads to lower prices, that's good for consumers and therefore it's okay. Um, so that's the lens that they decide whether it's antitrust or not. Yeah, whether they're gonna take a case, whether yeah. they're gonna try and break up a company. If it, if it improves consumer welfare, if it leads to lower prices, we're all good. And that by that definition, Amazon has been nothing if not great. Yeah, like yeah. they have driven Ticks prices down in industry after industry yeah, after industry. Yeah, destroyed some. <laughs> yeah, but Lena Khan's uh, uh, j journal article um, that it's tough to say article. It's like ninety eight pages. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say it's, it's not six hundred words. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, she suggests that we need to revisit that definition and go back to the. Um, the, old, the older way of thinking about antitrust law when, you know, Standard Oil and Carnegie mm, Steel mm. Um, were around, which is uh, basically that if companies have too much market power, even if they're creating lower prices, there are other harms that mean they need to be broken up. Mm. Um, and so for people who are watching this, um, you know, Lena Khan's obviously written this, has obviously been handpicked for the Biden administration. It is likely that she now has the platform to to test that case. And is there the political ability to actually pass this sort of change through? Well, I think it will be a test case, but if there's a political will around one thing, it's that everyone hates big tech yeah. at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, Amazon will probably be the test case. Well, this is me speculating, but you know, she's obviously got strong feelings about Amazon. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, Google, Facebook, this won't be the last time you hear about antitrust enforcement coming out of the Biden administration. And what w what's the result? Though? It's not a punishment. It would just be that, or would it be this is where they do the whole split up thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They either make them divest certain businesses, they force them to split up, or they regulate them in different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, to quickly close out, Ren, uh, the third piece, uh, the third piece of news that caught our attention this week was that is uh, Samsung is in a stage of crucial transition for a very interesting reason. Yeah, this, this is a news story that uh, isn't, isn't that recent. I think a lot of people would know about it, but I was speaking to a few people uh, and they didn't know about it. So I thought it was just worth talking about because it's very surprising. Um, Lee, uh, Lee J. Young, I've uh, probably pronounced that wrong, apologies. Uh, the, the third generation um, of the Lee family who heads up Samsung uh, is in jail. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sentenced to two years and six months by the High Court in South Korea for bribing the former South Korea president. Yeah. yeah. I mean, business is business. That's probably what would happen. Well, no, no. We busted. do not endorse we don't know. bribery. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, for people who are unfamiliar with South Korean uh, Che Bowls, it's basically family run industrial corporations. Um, Samsung is one of them, which means their fortunes are tied to the Lee family. Um, forever yeah and the head of this family the third generation to run samsung um is in jail for the next 
two and a half years. Which is rather concerning, I guess, given where Samsung are currently at in their business journey, I guess, and given that they're placed in the semiconductor. Yeah. And it's a, a pretty crucial time for the, for the business. So yeah, how, yeah. how um, he can be running it from a jail cell. Well, and no one is suggesting that this is like existential yeah. for Samsung. Yeah, as you said, Samsung is so important in so many industries, chief amongst them. Uh, microchips yeah. um, that they will be fine but it is just a really interesting uh, I guess story to watch unfold as you know we in Australia or people watching in the US won't be familiar with this whole like family run business to such an extent yeah. this, this Chabol system is unique and um, it'll be interesting to see what happens mm. yeah well, that brings us to the end of our episode for Monday. Uh, we have a big week of guests coming up, making up for lost time from last week. So, Ren, uh, looking forward to continuing with Equity Mates on Ausbiz. Can't wait. Equity Mates, from our mates at Spaceship. Investing made easy.